I, I have overcome the world. Man, what a day it has been here at Crossland Community Church. The last service was 44 children dedicated to the Lord, which is astonishing. Yeah. And uh, mm, it's just, it's amazing to watch God fill that pipeline. You know what I mean? You, you watch all these beautiful high school seniors who grew up here go out, and then there's 44 more coming, and it's just spectacular what God is doing. He is absolutely a God that is interested in building a remnant. It has always been the plan of God to have a remnant, that each generation would prepare the next generation to pick up what God has been doing and advance the ball down the field, okay? So we're thankful at Crossland. If you're a parent of a high schooler or any other child and you give us the privilege of pouring into their lives, we, it is truly a privilege and we take that responsibility seriously. We're thankful for the opportunity to spend time to partner with you. One of the things, if you asked any of our staff members involved with children or youth, they will tell you the one thing that will get my hair on fire is if you abdicate the role of the parent. You are not the parent. Don't act like the parent. Don't talk like the parent. Don't treat them like you're the parent, okay? They have a parent, and it's not us, okay? We are here to minister to them. We're here to support the parent, not replace the parent. And that is exactly what this church does with the hundreds of volunteers. And last thing, and I'll dive in. I hope you can feel the significance of your generosity. Seriously, when there were 44 kids, there were so many, we had to line them on the floor and on the stage, okay? And that side of the building is packed already. The nursery and preschool classrooms, it is a glorious thing. So thank you for all you're doing. God's blessed it. Week three of a series entitled In This World, and this is based upon the final verse uh, that John records of the conversation period of the final night of Christ, okay? It's his final meal, final moment, final night, and final words, to be honest with you. After this, you go into 17. 17 one says, and after Jesus said these things... Then he began to pray for himself, for the disciples, and he went on to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And when John reviewed back in, you know, 80, you know, 85, somewhere in there, 40-ish to 45 years after the resurrection of Christ, John wrote a gospel that is, while similar, yet very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he adds features that the other three didn't add. And part of the reason, of course, God led him to include things is, number one, the other things had been said, but also the culture and the time and the context into which John was writing was very different as well. And so the tone of John's gospel is very different than the others. And one of the things God, John talks about a lot is he talks about light and darkness, light and darkness, and his constant conflict of the two. And he talks a lot, as we saw last week, about the world in which you live and that is going to constantly be an environment that has the capacity to produce trouble. And Jesus would say in this, in this beautiful verse, the first thing he says to them is, I have told you these things. And that's the things from John 13 down to 1633. The content of it, and it's a conversation. It's not a monologue. It's not a sermon. It's, it's a conversation. I've told you these things so that in me you might have peace. And the things he told them, there's a wide variety of them, all the way down to, listen, they killed me, they're probably going to kill you. A pretty powerful message. And so he wants them to understand that there's something in them that is greater than anything they will face that's in this world, so that in me, you might have peace. And then last week we saw, because he, he's very honest with them, and says, in this world, this world, this world you live in right now, this cosmos, you will have trouble. And we just looked at the word cosmos is used three different ways, deals with creation, and there's creational pressure still. Uh, last couple of weeks, there's been a ton of rain in South Central Kentucky, and that creates problems, weather problems. There are famine issues. The creation was broken when Adam and Eve sinned. We know that. And so there are still creational issues, you know, that are going to create pressure for humanity. But it also refers to the world's creatures, and I think we're all pretty familiar with creatures being very annoying, with creatures creating all kinds of pressure for us, all kinds of external circumstances that really can create the sense that I can't breathe, 
And then last but not least, it always, it sends, the last sense is that the powers of evil and darkness are a part of the cosmos too. But we don't have to, like Paul says in Corinthians, while we will be hard pressed, we shall not be crushed. And I hope you remember the water bottle. You know, like I can stand on this till Jesus comes back and I don't have enough strength to push the water out of it. Now, some of you big old boys probably do, but this little fella can't squish the bottle. The whole point is, don't lose your cap. If the cap's off, I can crush the bottle with the cap on. I can't, I can't even get it to lose its shape. And today we continue because if that is true, and it is, then the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, is the pressure outside me we know it's opposite of the pressure within you, but is it equal? You know, is it Newton's third law, where there is an, e, an opposite and equal force against every reaction? It's called the reaction principle. So, you know, like, and I don't buy it, to be quite honest with you. I don't, I don't, I don't know where he came up with it. It's way too deep for me. But even thinking about it this week, I'm like, an equal and opposite, like if I play opposite George Fan, I'm defensive end, He's left tackle. They, they hike the ball, and I go like as hard as I can at George, and he goes, you can't tell me that's equal and opposite. It's opposite. There ain't no way it's equal. He's going to break my chest just by putting his hand up. So I'm going to have to look into old Newton. I'm not, not so sure what he was smoking, but I get what he means, okay, that there are, if nothing else, he's right, that there is always an opposition to anything that produces force. Sometimes it's friction, whatever that might be. And the same is true for you and I. But most followers of Jesus Christ conclude that evil, we accept. The brokenness of creation, we accept. The, the brokenness, of, we accept that there is opposition, there's trouble. And most Christians think it's equal. And it's not even remotely close. Like I can tell you Newton is absolutely wrong when it comes to the, the power that is within you is far greater than anything that could possibly go on around you. Guarantee it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And what we, if we're not careful, what we do, and there are times when it is the best thing to do, and that's stand your ground. You know, there's a lot of pressure trying to push you, move you, mold you, and all you can really do, and you should, is stand your ground. Don't give up any of the already achieved territory back to the enemy. Okay, you've finally gotten over a hang-up, you've finally gotten over a bad habit, don't give that territory back to him, right? We don't want to relapse, we don't want to go back, and if you do, okay, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, let's get going again. But biblical Christianity doesn't call us to stand our ground, it calls us to advance our cause. It's not sitting here and taking it on the chin as though we're victims of everything that happens around us. You are not a victim, okay? You're a victor. You're more than a conqueror who's in Christ Jesus. And if we're not careful, we will just take the stand. And there are times when you have to stand your ground. I get that. But most times, most things you face, if you're not willing to participate in the solution, you are never going to get where God wants you to be. In fact, when Jesus is going to tell you in a second is a commandment. See, I've told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. And you'll see what that means today. And it does not mean just sit there and take it. It means to continue to push towards the horizon that God has left you here on this planet for in every area of your life. If it's financial, you got to keep pushing. you got to participate in the solution. Physical, emotional, sexual, whatever it is, got to keep pushing in participating in the solution. You are nobody's pawn. Okay? And that's what John knew when he recorded this last verse that the others did not record because in the world at that point, it seemed for everybody that Christians were just pawns of the Roman Empire. They were killing them, crucifying them, persecuting them, slaughtering them anywhere they wanted to. They were finally in that bloodthirsty, maniacal, persecutorial moment in Roman history. And John writes to him and says, hey, that doesn't mean you just stand your ground. You got to take heart, okay? So today's big idea 
is we can actively, actively, okay, oppose the troubles of this world with courage and confidence, okay? The big word here today is can. You don't have to. You can, you don't. It is a command, and I would go so far as saying, if you don't, it is sin to not want to participate with the Holy Spirit in improving and accomplishing the reasons for which God left you here, okay? But you can do it because there is opposition. There is, don't let anybody tell you there isn't, but it's not equal. Like, think about me playing defensive end against George Fan. That is not an equal matchup. Now, I can oppose him for four quarters, well, probably for one play, but it's not equal, okay? It is not equal. Evil and God's goodness coexist, but they are not co-equal, all right? And here's the verse that we've been working on, and next week we'll have the last part. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, okay? This is the answer to that, okay? Now, the most important word maybe in this, these are just two words in the Greek, by the way, is but, okay? And if you don't understand the role of this word, you won't understand how substantial what's after it is, okay? Now, there are multiple terms in the Greek language that can be rendered but, okay? But this is actually ala, A-L-L-A, okay? And it's called, we have this in English too, it's called an adversative, okay? And an adversative that's inserted into a sentence becomes a compa- not a comparison, but it's saying that which is after the but is an adversary of that which is before it, okay? And it's a greater adversary, that the greatness of this, it's called an extended stipulation, is stronger. We do this in the English language, okay? It's stronger than what's before it. I could play defensive end against George Fant, but... I'm probably going to lose my life. See, that's an adversative. Because when you compare what's on both sides of the butt, the one on the other is undeniably more powerful, okay? So if you were to read this and be like, in this world you will have trouble, but I guess we could take heart. That is not the context of this. This is saying on the other side, this is powerful. This isn't just opposite. It is opposing it, but it's not equal. It's aggressive. Listen, Our courage is an adversary of our trouble. And it is not an equal adversary. Don't miss that. This is not a fair fight. This is Greg Farrell and George Fan. Uh, George, I hope you watch this, dude. I've only mentioned you like 30 times. Send me a jersey. Appreciate you. Take heart, okay? Take heart. But, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you about three or four verses where this will make such clear sense to you, okay? Here we go. What we face in this world is not equal. Don't forget that. Here's a couple examples. Matthew 6, 13. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So you got to ask yourself, is the temptation of the evil one equal to the power of God to lead us not into it? Well, of course not. Why would we even pray for God to help us with it if he was equal to the power of the temptation? If we ask God to deliver us, that which is on this side of the butt is far greater than that which is on the other side. Take this from the guy who was tempted personally by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness where he had no food and no water. He understands that is opposition at its absolute worst, and yet he did not sin. Why? Because the power that was in him was not equal to the power that was coming against him. It was greater. So if you're dealing with temptation, it's because you think the temptation is equal to the power of God to keep you from it. You're wrong. You're just flat out wrong. Okay, the power of God is far greater than that, okay? Just ask God to deliver you. If God isn't stronger than our temptations, we're in serious trouble. And he is. Number two, John three seventeen. same author. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If the salvation of Christ is equal to the condemnation of sin, then he did not conquer death. He just experienced it. 
But the Bible tells us that death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Right? Christ came and not only condemned sin, he condemned death. Death no longer even applies to a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, yes, you'll die. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about death, that eternal separation. You will never know death, see death, nor taste death. You will never know it, see it, taste it. Because the power of Christ is so compelling that he swallowed it up in victory. Right. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, this is in John 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. You can't tell me the power of Jesus Christ over death is imperfectly demonstrated in this experience. Yeah, the dude died. It's a sad and tragic, but it's not equal to me. Sure, Mary and Martha are devastated. That whole town is worried. But I'm going there to wake them up. What was more powerful, Jesus or death? Right, Jesus. And last but not least, 1 John 4.10. Three of them from John. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So whose love is really greater, ours or his? Right. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever will believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. I didn't even put that one up there. Right? So when Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Right? The take heart is far more powerful than the other side of the equation. If trouble is equal to Christ, we're in trouble. But we're, it's not. It's not even close, okay? And if that is true, then we should be doing this, right? We should bar- be participating in the constant advancement of not only the kingdom of God, but more importantly, the purposes of God for you. Sitting back and continuing to take it on the chin doesn't make sense, We've been called to participate. We're enabled to participate. And so what we want to do is be willing to do that. So I want to show you, I think, three times when this take courage so profoundly and powerfully enabled a dramatic change. And then I'm going to close with just a little bit about Paul. So Mark chapter 6, you see this also in John 6. You see it in uh, Luke somewhere. Like Maybe, I don't know, doesn't matter. But this is the walking on the water miracle. Heard of that one? Yes. Okay. So it's a feeding miracle first. There's a massive crowd of people, 5,000 men, not counting women and children. They're out there listening to this beautiful teachings of Jesus. The sun's going down, not enough food. How are we going to feed them? Jesus said, tell me what you got. And they bring over a little boy's lunch. And Jesus feeds 5,000 people plus women and children with 12 basket loads left over. He tells the disciples, grab what's left, go get on the boat. Now, you don't miss the fact that the sun's going down. This is the end of the day. And he tells them to get on the Sea of Galilee and go to the other side, about seven miles. Row that bad boy over there. Jesus says, I'll meet you over there. And he goes up on the mountain to pray. Halfway over, about three and a half miles in, an unbelievable storm, a tempest unleashes itself on them. The Bible says they can't go forward and they can't go backward. I think they're, they're just spinning their wheels right there. And Christ watches them until the fourth watch of the night, which is probably about 4 a.m., 5 a.m., just before the sun comes up. And he finally decides it's time, and he gets, walks down off the mountain on top of the water. When they see him, they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Okay, one of the gospels says they thought they were seeing a ghost, which it's hard to blame them. I've never seen anybody walk on water, to be honest with you. Don't know that I will. Not even in heaven because there's no water in heaven, which is kind of crazy. There's no seas and none of that. So you can imagine they're startled. And what's happening to them is the opposition is so great against them. They're not able to advance, nor they're capable of going back. Have you ever been in a situation where you're not getting anywhere? A marriage conflict, marriage fight, teenager, I know you've never had that, uh, works, whatever the situation might be, you're not getting anywhere. And then all of a sudden, a solution comes your way, and the solution is more frightening than the problem. Right? 
Want to go to rehab? No! Right? <laughs> I mean, the solution's terrible. Comparatively, that's what you think at least, right? You see it in mar- you know, with married couples, and you find, I mean, they're just, just dying. Or co- like, all right, here's what I suggest. I think you need to see a professional counselor to work on your marriage. No, I'm pull my pants up before that happens. Come on, Johnny. What are you, a fool? He's like, no, I ain't going to counseling. Counseling. I'm not going to counseling. I'm not going to counseling. Why would you not go to counseling? Because you're scared. Let's just be honest. You're afraid of that vulnerability. In fact, you know what the Bible would say, and if it's a woman or a man, and you don't, you're not willing to let another person into that situation to speak truth, you're a coward. Because the opposite of courage is cowardice. I'm not speaking. That, you, maybe that's the solution. If somebody with a financial situation, hey, you know what? I've got a handful of people we could hook you up with. They could help you set up a budget, you know, plastic surgery, cut up those cards, throw them away. We got half a dozen people at church to help you do that. They're not, they're not really financial planners, but they were trained through I was broke, now I'm not going to help you do it. They're like, no, nah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need a budget. You need a budget, right? And so don't, it's amazing how sometimes the solution walks right into the middle of us, and we're more afraid of that than we are the actual situation we're in. And Jesus says, immediately spoke to them and said what? Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Now, how do we know that courage was demonstrated at that moment? Well, one of the dudes actually gets out of the boat. And he starts walking on water. Because Peter said, if it's really you, call me out. And he said, come on, big boy. And you know what he did? He stepped right out into it. He not only let Christ walk into the middle of his problem, he had the courage it takes to step out of his boat and stand right in the midst of his own problem. He exposed himself completely to the problem. Then, of course, he took his eyes off of Jesus, began to sink, and Jesus grabbed him and said, hey, you a little faith. Then they climb in the boat. You know what the Bible says? Immediately, they got to the other side. So you want to spend the rest of your life doing this, getting nowhere, Versus allowing Christ to walk right into the middle of it. Because he can do for you immediately what you'll never even do eventually. And that takes courage. It takes conviction. That says, you know what? That which I'm facing is not nearly as strong as the Christ I believe in. The, that which is in front of me, it's opposing me, but it ain't equal to me. Right. Here's another story. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own hometown. Another trip across the Sea of Galilee. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. I think we can all agree that that's an opposing lifestyle. See, the first one, there was no way they were going to get to the other side, so Jesus came to them. This is, the man's never going to get to Jesus, so his friends bring him to him. It's a lot of courage to, you know, when you think about it. You know, these guys bring him a a paralyzed man lying on a mat. Courage looks like this. You bring him to the house, and there's no way to get in. Now, there's the opposition. The man was your opportunity. The crowd is your opposition. Some people would be like, well, we'll catch him tomorrow. Come on, buddy. Sorry, man. Come on, we'll catch him tomorrow. And they're like, what do you think? I think we could rip that off. Well, let's go rip off the roof. It's not their house. It is not their house. And they're like, you know what? I don't live here. Let's just go rip it off. Right? They rip. Now, I promise you, if you want to get a lost person in here and there's not an extra seat and you rip a hole in that roof, I will applaud you for that kind of deterrent. Because you know what they're saying is I'm not going to let that opposition be greater than Christ that's with me. I got to do what I got to do to advance the cause. I'm going to have to get a little bit creative. I can't get in through the door, but that ain't stopped me from ripping the roof off. That's exactly right. And we don't live like that sometimes. We don't have that kind of faith. When Jesus saw their faith, not his, theirs. Can you imagine Jesus sitting there? <laughs> oh, my. oh, 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 oh. I'm glad that ain't my roof, right? And they lower him and Jesus looks up. He's like, good God, look at their faith. And he says to the man, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, how do you know that he actually demonstrates the kind of courage that Jesus just saw? Because then Jesus looks at him and says, now get up, pick up that mat and walk. There's to make it or break it. Your sins are forgiven. You're going to continue to lay in that mess? That man's been laying in that mat his whole life. Every time he went to the bathroom, he went to the bathroom on himself. Everywhere he went, he was carried. Everywhere he went, everybody looked down on him. Is that the way you want to live the rest of your life? 
then you got to get up, take up, and walk. You can't just sit there and be like, oh, this is my lot for life. No, he tells you to that dude, man. He's like, woo. Ta-da. What's been carrying you? What have you been laying in? Do you really think Jesus wants to leave you in the same situation in which he found you? There is no way. And I know that you've never walked before. I've never know what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means. Just take the next step, man. Get in those waters. Get in a Bible study. Pray. Just do the Lord's Prayer. Just say, dear God, I'm awake. Would you help the world? I'm about to enter it. Whatever it takes, just do Take the next step. But to lay on that mat, can you imagine after everything that these guys did and Jesus forgave them to just, to just lay in that? Come on. You know you're made for greater than that. It's time to get up and start moving. Here's one. This is the woman who has that, that awful issue of bleeding nonstop for 12 years. And this is a critical, it's not just a medical condition, mind you, but it's a spiritual malady because she's not allowed in the temple. She's not allowed to participate in any of the annual feasts. She's not allowed to have any intimate contact if she's married, none at all. 12 years of being untouchable because she's bleeding. And the Bible says she took every dime she had and spent it on a variety of physicians, but no one could heal her. But you know what? She didn't take no for an answer. She didn't just sit back and say, I guess this is my lot. You know what she said? If I got to crawl on my hands and knees and just get a grab of his robe, that's what I'm going to do. And you know what? That's exactly what she did. She had to crawl through the crowd just to grab the bottom of his robe. So why are we taking no for an answer? I mean, Jesus turned to her and said, woman, take heart. <laughs> Your faith has healed you. Isn't that amazing? And she was healed at that moment. But it takes that kind of courage to be like, you know what? If I got to crawl on my hands and knees, then I'm going to crawl on my hands and knees. But what I'm not going to do is quit. You might get a lot of no's. You might have spent every emotional dime you have on whatever it is that's opposing you. But you still have something left in you that is far greater than that which is opposing you. And faith is that quality that says, listen, if I got to crawl, I'll crawl. But I'm not going to lay here and die. Right. Advance. 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 If these things are true, and they are, it's all the same word that's being used, then you can actively oppose the pressure. But you got to stay full, full of the confidence and conviction that produces the kind of courage that Jesus is talking about. In Acts chapter 23, I'm going to show you one verse and then we're going to be done. Paul is, at that verse, he's already been to Jerusalem. As this entire story begins, it's like Acts 20 or 21, and it ends in 23. Paul is on his way back from his last missionary journey. He does three major missionary endeavors, okay? And with some of them, he goes to new territories, but with each of them, he generally tries to get back to old territories as well. And now he's on his final approach to Jerusalem, He's in the region of Ephesus, where Paul had a major impact. So did John. And Paul goes, and he's leaving Ephesus, and he tells them, you'll never see me again. I'm going to Jerusalem. Well, the elders and the leaders of Ephesus come around Paul. They're like, dude, it's just like that time Jesus kept telling the disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be crucified, but I'll rise again on the third day. Paul knew when he gets to Jerusalem, probably going to take my life. And you know what the elders do in that community? Don't go, dude. They're already hunting you. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. They're going to kill you. Paul said, I got to go. And so in one of the most emotional scenes in the New Testament, the elders and the community leaders surround Paul and pray over him. And they weep uncontrollably because they know. It's the last time I'll ever see him. And Paul leaves Ephesus and he goes to Jerusalem. And he meets some of the leaders of the church, and they said, Paul, the most important thing you can do right now is present yourself inside the temple. Because if you go and show a little bit of support for the temple, you might just survive a little longer. But if you don't, dude, they're, they're going to kill you. 
And so Paul does what they suggest, and he goes in the temple, and immediately they recognize him. And immediately they're enraged. There is the man who defies Judaism, and he's teaching Gentiles to do the same. And so a mob grabs him and begins to beat him and beat him with sticks and clubs. They drag him out of the temple and they close the gates behind. They take him out of the temple area and this mob is massive. And they are literally kicking him and beating him to death. It's such a major riot that some of the Roman police officers or Roman soldiers are part of the encampment of Roman soldiers to keep the peace. They and their centurion, who's their leader, run into the area like, is this a, a resur- uh, an insurrection? What's going on? And they run in and they see this one guy on the ground being beaten. So they run in and they grab him. And they can't get him out of the mob. So they, it's like a mosh pit. They pick him up over their head. And they literally march Paul out. And they take him to the barracks. And they put him down. And it's pretty much, dude, what have you done? What have you done to deserve this? And a little bit of conversation and... The centurion decides to do much like Pilate did. I don't really see any reason to kill him, but let's flog him. Let's strip him of his clothes and take that cat and nine tail, tie him to the stump. We'll beat him 39 times. You know, that's a nasty beating. Always opens up your organs. You'll see kidneys, the back of the liver. A lot of people die from it. Christ didn't. So they take him out and strip him and tie him to that stump. The guy gets the cat and nine tails, the soldier, and just before he hits him, Paul asks him a very simple question. Is it lawful for you to torture a Roman citizen without trial? It's a great question. And the guy stopped and said, are you Roman? He said, I am. Scared him to death because to do what he's getting ready to do was punishable by death. It's capital punishment. So he went out and he got the centurion and said, you know what, We're, we have a problem here. That dude's a Roman citizen. Now all of a sudden he's got cold chills. He walks into Paul and he says, are you a Roman citizen? He said, yeah. And the centurion said to him, I paid a lot of money to buy mine. And Paul said, that's interesting. I was born one. Ooh. And the guy stepped back and they kept him in the barracks and they finally decided, What are we going to do with this guy? And you know what Paul said? I demand to go to Caesar. And you know what the centurion pretty much thought to himself? Thank God, because I don't know what else to do with you. You request Caesar, to Caesar you will go. It's always had been God's plan for Paul to preach the gospel to Caesar. But as an itinerant, Jewish, teaching uh, Christian... For him to just walk into the streets of Rome, he wasn't getting to Caesar. The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks, just as I told you. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, dude, take courage, man. They just beat him. I mean, beat him mercilessly. And the next night, the Lord says, hey, man, you take courage. If you've testified about me in Jerusalem, you got to testify about me in Rome. And it's hard to fathom that a beating in Jerusalem could be a part of God's plan for your life. It's hard to believe that you might just find yourself on the cusp of an injustice, having no idea what God's doing. And he knows that sometimes he's got to take us to Jerusalem in order to get us into Rome. Because he doesn't want you to just go to Rome. He wants you to go to Caesar. He wants to advance the cause. He doesn't want you to think that the power of uh, Roman soldiers and Roman authority is even remotely close to his power. And I wish I could tell you that you don't have a Jerusalem awaiting you. What I'm going to tell you is you do, because in this world you will have trouble. But take heart. But take heart. 
Because what's on the right side of that butt is far more powerful than what you'll experience in your own private Jerusalem. And God can cause all things to work together for your good. And it's in these moments where like, all I want to do is just take my stand. No, nope. we got to advance it. We got to advance it. We got to advance it. We got to keep pushing. Is there anything crazier than Paul having to take a beating in order to get the gospel to Rome? Yep. Jesus having to take a beating to get the gospel to you. This is the gospel. The good news, that the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church, and that God will continue to push this issue until you accept his son. He's more relentless than you are. He's more passionate than you are. He's more powerful than you are. He will chase you down and hunt you down, not to pay you back, but to win you back. And he was willing to crush his son to push the horizons as far as he had to in order to save you. You are the reason why we are here. Morgantown, Glasgow Online in this room. We're not going to allow the obstacles of this world to stop us. They're real, they're hard, they're painful. But we got to push on through. We got to have courage, not violence, courage to believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And to be honest with you, the most courageous thing you will ever do is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because right now you stand opposed to God and God stands opposed to you. The Bible says you are at enmity, hostility with one another. But the love of God is far greater than your hate for Him, your indifference to Him, your ignorance of Him, whatever it is that's keeping you on this side. His love is far greater. It's going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And all you have to do is surrender. When you surrender to God, there's going to become a a power because there's a person. The Holy Spirit will indwell you. And the hard-pressed circumstances of this life will not go away. They won't, but they won't crush you. The hard-pressing circumstances of trouble in this world will not leave you, but they cannot stop you either. Whatever God has made you for and left you here for absolutely will be accomplished. Because God cannot be denied except by you. Don't deny Him. Don't deny Him. Surrender. Believe that God sent Christ to absorb the greatest beating ever. And that was for the sins of humanity. But He didn't stay dead. He raised himself from the dead and proved it. And what you and I have to do is believe. Believe in our heart that God raised his son from the dead. And then speak with your mouth that he is in fact Lord. He's my leader. You will be saved. You will be saved. I wish I could tell you you would be safe. But you won't be you will be saved and then one day forevermore you'll be saved and safe Father we love you and thank you you so prepare us with your word you're not offering a fairy tale it's not a free ride to Disney World but it doesn't mean we're pawns that we're just victims of the whims and the wills and the ways of this broken world in which we live. We're not that at all. We're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And today I pray that if you're in this room or any of our rooms, 
why don't you just turn it over? Why don't you just turn it over? Accept Christ. He's waiting to accept you. Are you there in this moment? And why don't you just quietly, if you want to, nobody's looking, just raise your hand. You don't even have to get it above your head. And it's God looking for it, not me. Just raise your hand and acknowledge, you know what? I'm here, God. I'm here. And maybe you're just afraid somebody will sense that. So just move your head and look up. Just look up into the air. Just say, Jesus is Lord. Just look at the ceiling. You don't have to look at me. Just look up at me. Jesus is Lord. That's all it takes. And you will be saved. And then you get in these waters, and it's amazing. They don't save you, but boy, how do they have the power to change you? Do it now. Father, we love you, and how you love us is indescribable. And I'm so thankful you didn't send Jesus so that bad people could become good. (laughs) That ain't going to happen. So that dead people could be made alive. And that this life we engage in is everlasting. And in this world, we're going to have trouble. But take heart. Take heart. We don't have to take it on the chin anymore. We can advance. We can move forward. We can experience the life everlasting right here, right now that Jesus came to give us.